My name is Mark Lebwell. I'm chairman of the Department of Dermatology at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and I'm going to discuss with you today the clinical assessment and principles of management of psoriasis. And uh, I'm going to discuss the management of all forms of severity of psoriasis. Now, in the next slide, we see uh, a, a long list of psoriasis therapies, uh, and uh, there are many to choose from, but our treatment is based on a number of factors. Certainly, primar primary among them is the extent of disease. Uh, we're not going to use a systemic therapy in a patient who only has mild plaques on the elbow. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a topical therapy in a patient who, who has most of his body surface area covered by psoriasis uh, is not going to be practical. So uh, in this patient, we would use systemic therapy in the in a patient who has only mild isolated plaques on the elbows, we're more likely to just use topical therapy. Um, the severity rating score that is most widely used for psoriasis is called the PASI score. Uh, and this was developed in the late 1970s uh, in a study of a, a, a new oral retinoid for psoriasis. Um, uh, the, um, the PASI score uh, is... PASI stands for Psoriasis Area and Severity Score, is constructed from a number of factors. The degree of erythema or redness, the degree of infiltration or plaque thickness, and the degree of desquamation or scaling is measured on a zero to four scale. Zero means that there's no redness, infiltration, or desquamation. If the patient is scored a 4, that means that it's severe, either erythema, infiltration, or desquamation. And 1, 2, one, two and 3 are uh, different levels between them. So 3 is severe, but not very severe. Uh, 2 is moderate, and 1 is slight. Um, so each of those three target symptoms, redness, thickness, and scaling, erythema, infiltration, and desquamation, are rated on that 0 to 4 scale. The next component of the PASI score is the percent of body surface area that's affected. Um, so the head counts for approximately 10% of the body surface area. The trunk uh, is 30%. The upper extremity is 20%. And the lower extremities, which includes the buttocks, is 40%. Um, and these are all evaluated, again, on the basis of what proportion of the of that each each part of the body is affected. So for example, if you look at the scalp, which counts for ten percent of the total body surface area, how much of the scalp is affected? If it's clear, the patient's scored a zero. If it's a hundred percent involved or ninety percent involved, the patient's given a score of six. Um, for different scores in the in the middle, for example, somebody who has approximately 50% or a little bit less than 50% body um, of the scalp involved, that patient would get a three. If it's over 50% of the scalp involved, that patient's scalp score would be a four. Um, the same exercise is done for the upper limbs, lower limbs, and trunk. Um, now, in the next slide, um, we we put together all the numbers we constructed. Uh, we put together the score that we've given for each of the symptoms and multiply the head by 10%, the trunk score by 30%, the uh, arm score by 20%, and the leg score by 0.4. Uh, and we then end up with a number that ranges anywhere from zero for a patient who's completely clear to 72 for a patient who has very severe involvement of the entire body surface area. Um, so, again, the highest score you can get is 72. The lowest score you can get is zero. Uh, and then, uh, we, with treatments, we measure how much that PASI score has been affected. If there is a 75% reduction in PASI score, which is an excellent outcome, uh, that would be a PASI 75. If the patient has a 50% reduction in PASI score, which is a good outcome, that patient would have a PASI 50 score. Um, for patients who clear completely, the PASI score, which is a measure of improvement in psoriasis severity, is 100. It's a PASI 100. If somebody is 90% improved uh, in their PASI score, that's a PASI 90. Um, and those are the, the uh, terms by which different psoriasis treatments are measured.
Now, um, the degree of severity that a patient starts out with largely determines uh, whether the patient is mild, moderate, and severe, and largely determines what treatments we're going to give to that patient. So if a patient has less than 3 to 5% of body surface area, that is usually mild, and there are some exceptions to that, which I'll show you in the next couple of slides. Um, if the patient has anywhere from 3 to 5% up to 10 to 20%, um, that patient would be considered as having moderate psoriasis. And patients who have more than 10 to 20% body surface area are considered as having severe psoriasis. Now, um, the next slide shows a, uh, an exception to that rule. Uh, the palm of the hand is considered a, approximately 1% of body surface area. So here's a patient who has the soles of both feet severely affected, this is less than you know, 3% or 4% of body surface area. It's only a little bit more than two palms. Um, yet this would be considered severe disease because imagine every time this patient has to take a step, uh, it, it hurts, the skin cracks. Uh, and so even though it's only a small percent of body surface area, this is a debilitating form of psoriasis. Um, same with the next slide, which shows psoriasis on the forehead and scalp even though it may only be the forehead and scalp and a small percent of the patient's body surface area, uh, imagine how debilitating this is every time this person meets anyone. They can see very obviously that the patient has bad psoriasis in the scalp. So um, body surface area is not the entire story. Now, uh, in terms of the management of psoriasis, nearly every patient gets some form of topical therapy. Um, and that may range from over-the-counter therapies to prescription topical therapies. In patients who have severe disease that is too severe to treat topically, we still often use a topical along with, for example, phototherapy. So ultraviolet light treatments don't get into the scalp. The pa those patients are almost always using some topical therapies for the scalp, or until they clear they might need a topical therapy for exposed parts of the body that people see, like the face or the elbows. Um, uh, same holds true for systemic therapy. We would rather use less systemic therapy, like methotrexate or cyclosporin, that have toxicities and have a few residual plaques that we treat with topical therapy than expose the patients to higher doses of drugs that have side effects. Um, also, systemic therapies may work slowly. So for the first weeks of treatment, you may need to use a topical therapy to clear areas that are visible. And now in terms of topical therapy, we have a long list of available treatments. Uh, TAR is one of the oldest treatments that we have. Uh, and, uh, you know, I joke that, that TAR is very useful for roofs and highways, um, but frankly, a real mess for uh, patients there are some cosmetically more elegant TARs, and those are certainly a big improvement over crude coal tar, uh, which was the old treatment for psoriasis. Um, there are also variations of TAR. One related product is called anthralin, uh, but you can see that uh, in this photograph, anthralin uh, has cleared this patient's plaques of psoriasis, but wherever the anthralin was applied, you can see that the skin has stained. Um, so there are some tricks to eliminate that staling, staining. Uh, there are all, also some tricks to eliminate the stinging that occurs with anthralin. But the reason that it's not more widely used is that it does stain the skin, and it also stains your entire house. So uh, that can be quite a, quite a mess. Now, the most common prescriptions for psoriasis are topical corticosteroids. Uh, and this is a photograph taken from our sample closet of about 20 years ago. Because most of these are now generic uh, we are not sampled very often with topical steroids anymore. Nevertheless, they are very effective, uh, and that is why they're used as much as they are. Um, so here you're looking at a photograph of a plaque of psoriasis in the axilla of a patient, and here's the same patient only a week later after application of a topical corticosteroid. So steroids are effective. That's why they are used. Um, now, the same steroid that you'd use in the axilla, you would not use in the scalp, um, certainly an ointment in the scalp would be much too messy, hard to wash out, and would not be a typical treatment to use in the scalp. That's why we've developed steroids with in many different vehicles. 
Um, here you're looking at a gel, which is more useful on hairy areas, a lotion, uh, which can be used on the body or on hairy areas, uh, ointments, which are really only practical on the body, not in hair-bearing areas, um, solutions, which are uh, very useful in the scalp, uh, and uh, creams, which are cosmetically nicer than ointments, um, uh, and very useful primarily on the body, not in hairy areas. Um, there are some novel uh, uh, vehicles as well. This next slide shows a foam, um, which um, when it is applied to the skin, uh, body temperature converts it to a liquid. Um, so it's very cosmetically elegant. You can see where you apply it, unlike a liquid which disappears as soon as you apply it. This you can see because it's white where it is applied, and it then evaporates quickly so it doesn't leave a mess. And this can be used in the scalp or on the body. Um, there are also shampoos that have uh, corticosteroids in them. Uh, there are even corticosteroid impregnated tapes uh, that are used to occlude different areas of the body. Um, so uh, steroids are available in many vehicles, and we match the vehicle to the body part that's being treated. Um, the next slide that I'm showing you is a photograph that I took years ago from the package insert of 1% hydrocortisone, uh, which was available at the time in a uh, prescription strength. This is the same strength of corticosteroid, 1% hydrocortisone, that is now over the counter in a number of formulations. Um, uh, and look at this list of side effects, burning, itching, irritation, dryness, folliculitis, hypertrichosis, acneiform eruption, hypopigmentation. Uh, and then there are a whole host of more serious side effects, such as glaucoma or um, uh, suppression of the uh, HPA axis. Um, and um, dermatologists primarily are concerned about topical s side effects. We don't see the more serious side effects often like HPA axis suppression, but certainly pediatricians do pay a lot of attention to those uh, side effects, and the parents of children always read the package insert. So, um, so you have to be aware of what it says in there. Now, I will say that, again, most of these don't happen, but the ones that we are worried about are the ones that affect the skin. Um, and uh, here you're looking at a patient who has been using a um, moderately potent corticosteroid on the face for too long a period of time and has developed telangiectasia on the face. In this next slide, um, you can see how atrophied and shiny the shin of this patient is. Uh, every time this patient walked into anything, and here he banged into a suitcase, he lacerated his skin. The skin is so thin that you can see the blood vessels through that thinned epidermis and dermis. Uh, in the next photograph, you have one of the more troubling side effects of uh, topical corticosteroids. If you overuse topical corticosteroids on the face, you get an acne-like condition called perioral dermatitis. And one of the problems with this condition is that when you apply a steroid to it, it improves, but the patient becomes more and more addicted to steroids, and you end up having to use stronger and stronger steroids to control it. Um, so it is a very difficult condition to, um, to, to treat because it's hard to get patients off of corticosteroids. Um, the next slide shows uh, a patient with a condition that is called steroid purpura. Uh, what corticosteroids do is they increase collagenase in the skin, which eats up the dermis, the supporting structures around your blood vessels, so that the dermis becomes thinned. And every time this patient bangs into a wall or touches something, her her blood vessels are, the cushioning around her blood vessels is gone, and the blood vessels leak, and that causes steroid purpura. Probably the single most dreaded side effect of topical corticosteroids is shown in this next slide, and that's called strii or stretch marks. Um, these are irreversible. I don't care what laser you own, you're not going to get rid of these. This is torn dermis. Um, now, the red, you may be able to lighten the red color of the stretch marks, and they can become yellow or white, uh, but the stretch marks will be there permanently. Um, uh, in the next slide, I have the photograph of a patient who uh, applied a corticosteroid uh, to, the, to the groin. I don't know what rash she was treating. Uh, her uh, internist gave her a corticosteroid, uh, and... Uh, as she applied it, she, 
steroids cause vasoconstriction and they start out and stretch marks start out as red. So the vasoconstriction caused by the corticosteroid made it blanch and made it look better. So she kept going back to the internist, said that when she applied the steroid, it got better, and he kept giving her stronger and stronger corticosteroids to eliminate these stretch marks. Uh, And eventually, she applied it for so long that she ended up getting stretch marks going all the way down from her groin to the middle of her calf. Um, So stretch marks are a very bad side effect to get from corticosteroids. And in fact, there have been lawsuits in which, which doctors lost for prescribing corticosteroids for patients who developed uh, strii as a result. Now, how do we avoid strii and the other cutaneous side effects of steroids? And in this next slide, I'm showing you the four most commonly prescribed non-steroids available for the treatment of psoriasis. Um, And uh, three of these are vitamin D analogs. That's calcipotrine, uh, cream and ointment, uh, calc- and calcitriol um, ointment are, are vitamin D analogs. And the fourth one, tazarotene, is a vitamin A derivative. It's a retinoid. Um, in this next slide, you see the central plaque where the retinoid was applied, and around it there's an area of, retin- of um, redness, which is a retinoid dermatitis, uh, because retinoids are irritating. Um, so... Uh, this was caused by tazarotene, and I use tazarotene quite a bit because it doesn't cause cutaneous atrophy, but I always use it with atopical corticosteroids to eliminate the irritation that is caused by tazarotene. In the next slide, on the patient's left elbow, you can see a plaque of psoriasis that was treated with vehicle, and on the right elbow, you see a plaque of psoriasis that was treated with calcipotrine, a vitamin D analog. Um, And calcipotrine certainly is effective. The main problem of calcipotrine is shown in the next slide. And what you're looking at here is the forehead of a patient who is one of our in our calcipotrine studies. Uh, And he remembered applying the calcipotrine on his elbows where he had psoriasis. And then he wiped sweat off of his forehead after he applied the calcipotrine to his elbows. And he developed an irritant contact dermatitis on the forehead. As many as 20% of patients treated with calcipotrine ointment or cream will develop an irritant contact dermatitis, and in particular, it occurs on the face and intertriginous sites. The areas that are most susceptible to steroid side effects are also the most susceptible to irritation from um, the vitamin D analogs. Um, Now, that led to the development of calcitriol ointment, uh, and what you're looking at here is a patient who was treated in a clinical trial where his right axilla was treated with calcitriol with a good response, and his left axilla was treated with calcipotrine, where he has this irritant contact dermatitis because of the calcipotrine. So calcitriol is similar to calcipotrine in efficacy, but um, uh, it is uh, less irritating in facial and intertriginous sites, and that's where its advantage lies. Uh, Now, psoriasis can occur on the eyelids. Um, Other common steroid-responsive dermatoses like eczema commonly occur on the eyelids. Uh, And the problem with treating the eyelids with corticosteroids is that they cause cataracts and glaucoma. And uh, this is one of many, many publications which show the development of glaucoma following prolonged use of topical corticosteroids on the eyelids, even weak corticosteroids. Uh, In this next study... Um, a a group of Indian uh, ophthalmologists used a uh, weak corticosteroid eye drop twice daily for three weeks. And they used it on a group of patients whom they divided into three groups. One of the groups of patients uh, were people who had a personal history of glaucoma. And when they applied this weak steroid eye drop um, uh, twice daily for three weeks, Um, nearly all the patients with glaucoma developed increases in intraocular pressure. Um, The second group of patients were relatives of people with glaucoma, and nearly, nearly, um, uh, uh, and the the vast majority of those patients also developed an increase in intraocular pressures 
when, um, when they were treated with those steroid eye drops. The third group of patients were patients who did not have a personal or family history of glaucoma, and 50% of those patients developed increases in intraocular pressure just from three weeks of application of this corticosteroid eye drop. So the message here is that the patients didn't develop glaucoma. They developed increases in intraocular pressure. And the message here is that t- corticosteroids um, and topical corticosteroids get, get, get through the eyelid. Corticosteroids can cause glaucoma, and we should be careful about, about prolonged use of a corticosteroid in a uh, condition like psoriasis, which is a chronic condition. Um, that has led us to the use of topical calcineurin inhibitors, such as tacrolimus ointment or pemecrolimus cream, uh, to treat the face and eyelids of patients with psoriasis. Um, now, I, you know, I, I, I've spent most of my time talking about um, topical therapy, and that is what is used by the vast majority of patients. In patients with moderate to severe disease, the alternatives we have range from ultraviolet light treatments to a number of pills that are available and to a number of injectable biologic agents. In terms of phototherapy, and you're looking at an ultraviolet box here, um, there are three forms of generalized phototherapy. Uh, One is called broadband UVB. That's been in use for almost 100 years. It is safer than sunlight. Um, There's not been any documentation of an increase in skin cancers from broadband UVB. Um, the, uh, the second uh, treatment that's been around for, at this point, about uh, 40 years is called PUVA, a little under 40 years. Uh, and PUVA is a treatment in which we administer a pill called oxorolin to patients. We wait for anywhere from one to two hours for the oxorolin to get into the skin. It is then activated by ultraviolet A. Um, and that is a very, very effective form of treatment for psoriasis. Unfortunately, there is an, a clear increase in skin cancers, especially squamous cell carcinoma, in patients treated with PUVA. And after 20 years, we, we are beginning to see a slight increase in melanomas in patients treated with PUVA. So it's a treatment that we uh, use cautiously. Um, I primarily use it in patients who are dark-skinned because they have a lower risk of developing skin cancers. Um, the third form of generalized phototherapy that is used is called narrowband UVB, and it turns out that the spectrum of ultraviolet B that is most effective for psoriasis is somewhere between 308 and 313 nanometers. So someone developed a bulb that is 311 nanometers, and it's the perfect spectrum for treating psoriasis. Um, early data, and this, is only, this treatment's only been around about 15 years, but early data indicates that there is not a, an increase in skin cancers like what we saw very early on with PUVA. Um, uh, and it is uh, more effective than broadband UVB and a little less effective than PUVA. So it has replaced a lot of our uh, phototherapy um, since its, incep- its development in the past decade or decade and a half. Um, there is also a localized form of phototherapy called the eczema laser, which is high-intensity 308 nanometer um, ultraviolet B, and it is very effective at clearing localized plaques of psoriasis. This next slide brings us to the oral therapies for psoriasis, and one of the oldest treatments we have for psoriasis is methotrexate. Uh, It is available both in liquid form, which can be ingested. You can uh, draw it out and squirt it into fruit juice, or uh, it's available more commonly and more commonly used in pill form. Um, the liquid can also be injected um, and is equally bioavailable. Um, so in pill form, it comes in usually two and a half milligram pills. Um, uh, it is given on a weekly basis uh, and has been around for many decades. Um, uh, methotrexate has been associated with a number of serious side effects. Uh, it's one of the side effects that is of most concern is the development of hepatic fibrosis. And unlike rheumatoid arthritis patients who probably have fewer risk factors for hepatic fibrosis than psoriasis patients, because our psoriasis patients are uh, often obese, um, uh, our patients do actually get hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis of the liver from methotrexate. Um, As a result, 
the guidelines which you see here advocated liver biopsies every one to one and a half grams after uh, 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 after starting uh, methotrexate. Uh, in the next photograph, you see a patient of mine who you notice has no psoriasis, but he. Uh, that's because he's on cyclosporin for his liver transplant. Uh, this is a patient who did not get liver biopsies and developed advanced cirrhosis of the liver uh, and had to have a liver transplant. Um, the dilemma here is that um, uh, in the slide that you look at here, notice that uh, they report that as many as 24% of patients develop hepatic fibrosis after five years. Um, the other side of that, however, is that liver biopsies are not entirely benign. This is a review of 21 years of nearly 10,000 liver biopsies at the Mayo Clinic, and notice that there were 10 fatalities and 22 non-fatal hemorrhages that required surgical intervention. So uh, bleeding is a real side effect of uh, liver biopsy, and that's why liver biopsies are not uh, that popular. Um, uh, as a result, the um, guidelines on biopsy of the liver have been recently revised, uh, and it turns out that according to the new guidelines, if patients don't have risk factors for hepatic fibrosis, you can skip the liver biopsy or the frequency of liver biopsies can be markedly reduced. Uh, what are the risk factors for hepatic fibrosis? Um, patients who are on alcohol, who drink alcohol, probably should be on a different treatment than methotrexate. Um, so uh, alcohol consumption is to be avoided while on methotrexate. Patients who have elevated liver function tests, um, if they're going to go on methotrexate, will need liver biopsy monitoring. Uh, patients with a history of hepatitis B or C um, will need liver biopsy monitoring. Diabetes is a risk factor for hepatic fibrosis. Uh, obesity is perhaps the most common risk factor for uh, that our psoriasis patients have for hepatic fibrosis. Uh, the average psoriasis patient is overweight, um, so um, that ends up uh, requiring liver biopsies in many patients. And there are a number of other risk factors, such as hyperlipidemia. And if patients have those risk factors, they either should look for an alternative drug or they should be monitored with liver biopsies. Um, uh, outside the U.S., they use some serologic monitoring that we hopefully will get in this country soon, but we don't have it here yet. Um, now, the other side effect that is often overlooked with methotrexate is bone marrow suppression. And this is a report of 70 cases of pancytopenia, including 12 deaths caused by methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. And in published prospective clinical trials of low-dose methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, the frequency of pancytopenia was 1.4%. So clearly uh, a, uh, a dangerous side effect of methotrexate. Um, the other, uh, the second systemic drug approved for psoriasis is cyclosporin, and that's been associated with a, a number of side effects, uh, and the worst one being kidney damage. In fact, in patients who are on cyclosporin for more than a year, the chance of developing kidney damage of some sort, nephrosclerosis of some sort, approaches 100%. And that's why the current U.S. guidelines call for discontinuing cyclosporine after a year, if possible. Um, hypertension is also a very common side effect. There are a number of other side effects reported with cyclosporine. Everybody always pays attention to uh, sexual frenzy. Unfortunately, that's been reported only in Michigan. Now, the next photograph that you see is a patient who with severe psoriasis, and uh, after two weeks in the next slide, you see that his psoriasis has completely cleared on cyclosporine. It is a dramatically effective treatment for psoriasis. The third oral medication approved for psoriasis is acetretin, uh, and its main side effect is teratogenicity. Uh, it cannot be used in women of childbearing potential because uh, according to the package insert, women should not become pregnant for three years after ingesting acetretin. Um, it um, has a number of other side effects, uh, primarily mucocutaneous side effects such as chelitis or hair loss, especially when used at high doses. Uh, it also commonly elevates the cholesterol and triglycerides, which have to be monitored when you're treating patients with acetretin. Now, by itself, 
it is very slowly effective and not sufficiently effective. But when it is used in combination with ultraviolet light, it is very effective. And here's a patient prior, who's just been started on an oral retinoid um, for two weeks, and then uh, the retinoid was continued for six more weeks while the patient started broadband UVB. And after another six weeks, so the patient is now on eight weeks of the retinoid and six weeks of um, UVB, and you see complete clearing. Uh, and the same is true here. This is at baseline, and this is after a total of eight weeks, six weeks of UVB and eight weeks of the oral retinoid. Again, a before, another after, another before, another after. So this is a dramatically effective uh, treatment for psoriasis. Um, uh, that now that is all of the oral treatments currently available for psoriasis uh, that are approved for psoriasis. Um, the um, injectable treatments that have recently been introduced to the market are called biologics. Uh, the four approved biologics for psoriasis are shown here, uh, and they include etanercept, adalimumab, infliximab, and ustekinumab, along with their brand names. These are uh, a big advantage in some ways over uh, the oral treatments available until now, but the big drawback is that they are all much more expensive. Um, so the next slide that you're looking at shows what happens to the PASI score when you um, treat patients with infliximab, which is given by intravenous infusion, and you see that the uh, that by week as early as week six, the improvement in PASI score on average is 75%, and by the end of 10 weeks, uh, you're looking at the high dose, 10 milligram per kilogram, over 80% of patients have achieved PASI 75. At the low dose, over 75% have achieved PASI 75. Uh, dramatically effective treatment, and that is shown in this before and after photograph here. Um, Etanercept uh, is... Uh, uh, was one of the first treatments approved for psoriatic arthritis um, and uh, is also approved for psoriasis. Um, the usual dosage in the United States has been to start patients at 50 milligrams twice a week, which is the yellow line that you see here. And by week 12, you're looking at um, uh, approximately um, 60 65% of patients achieving, uh, I'm sorry, approximately a 65% improvement in PASI score. If you were to continue at that dose, by the end of 24 weeks, 71% of patients achieve, uh, this, I'm sorry, there's a 71% improvement in PASI score. Um, if you, uh, uh, at three months, uh, according to the package insert in the United States, we reduce the dose from 50 milligrams twice a week to once a week. And if you had started out with just 50 milligrams once a week, the red line shows that by the end of 24 weeks, 62% of patients achieve, I'm sorry, there's a 62% improvement in PASI score. Um, so uh, the usual regimen, again, is to start out at 50 milligrams twice a week and then go down to once a week. And when you do that, approximately 60% improvement in PASI score occurs. This uh, third slide of biologic therapies shows the response to adalimumab, and you can see a very rapid improvement in PASI score. And by week 12, if you use adalimumab every week, um, you see approximately an 80% improve, uh, improvement in PASI score. If you use it every other week, um, you see a slightly lower, uh, almost 70% improvement in PASI score. The um, uh, adalimumab is, is started with a loading dose where patients are treated with two injections on the first day, uh, and then the next injection is given a week later, and then they are treated either every week or every other week. And this last slide um, of uh, biologic therapy shows the PASI response to ustekinumab. Uh, and this is a drug that's administered, administered by subcutaneous injection in the office at day zero, at four weeks, and then every three months thereafter. And notice a very rapid improvement in PASI score, uh, and uh, you're seeing um, uh, PASI scores in the 80% range uh, in patients treated with ustekinumab, so dramatically effective treatment. And I'm going to close with a slide 
with a phone number for the National Psoriasis Foundation, which has been a wonderful resource for uh, physicians and patients with psoriasis. Um, feel free to make use of that uh, of that phone number. Thank you very much.